I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, greetings and salutations. Welcome to another day in the Lord's neighborhood and a fabulous episode of Coffee, the Bible, and Paige. I am your caffeine-imbued host, Paige. Here's my caffeine. And they all said, in the beginning, coffee and lo, it was very, very good. Well, today we're closing in on the end of the reign of David. We're at getting close to the end of David's life. He's just overcome the uh, attempted coup by his son Absalom. We're setting him up for another coup by another son. Ugh, not good. But today we're going to uh, we're going to start to address a question I've had from the very beginning of David's reign as king. His problem with Joab. I just don't understand why he has not been able to oust Joab. And we're going to see Joab flexing his muscles again in today's chapter. And then at the end of this, we're going to uh, come up with a few ideas. Maybe I've, I've come across some resources that have given some thoughts as to why David was unable to get rid of Joab. So we'll give that a shot, see what comes up. But anyway, let's get started with chapter 20. Get your coffee and your Bible and join me as I think with my mouth open. Now, a troublemaker named Sheba, son of Bikri, a Benjamite, happened to be there. He sounded the trumpet and shouted, We have no share in David, no part in Jesse's son, every man to his tent Israel. All right, first of all, David has just defeated Absalom. He's coming back to Jerusalem. And Israel and Judah have had this little scuffle about who loves the king more. I mean, it sounds like a couple third graders in a, in a uh, playground fight. But apparently, one of Saul's relatives, or at least somebody from Saul's tribe, from the tribe of Benjamin, is not having any of it. And he is going to try to incite a rebellion among in Israel. Now, Sheba is a Benjamite, may have been Saul's relative, as I said. Um, there might have been residual alliance to Saul because David is still wrestling with that. Uh, Saul was not unloved, at least by his tribe, the Benjamites. So perhaps this guy thought this was his shot to just sever ties with David entirely. Don't know. Uh, but we can see that um, it's not going to work well. So all the men of Israel deserted David to follow Sheba, son of Bikri. But the men of Judah stayed by their king all the way from Jordan to Jerusalem. All right. So much for this alliance with Israel, right? It looks like they're looking for an excuse to run away from David. David's hold on the monarchy of this nation is very shaky at this point. Um, at the first call to rebellion, they ran away. Just like they ran away when Absalom called them to rebellion. Israel does not. Now, when I say Israel, I'm talking about the northern tribes or southern tribes. I'm talk, not talking. I'm talking about everything except Judah, basically. They're looking for an excuse to dump David. So they're not happy with him. So his monarchy wasn't all uh, jelly jams and roses, right? So, gosh, David, you're at the end of your life. And this is something that, that I can identify with to a degree. He has spent his whole life... Uh, since he's 12 or 13, aiming at becoming king of Israel because God anointed him to be king over Israel. 
He's at the end of his life. The, his monarchy, his reign is coming to a close. He's an old man now. He's in his upper 60s. And he's going to die when he's 70. So he's an old man. Uh, he's starting to become feeble. And he's seeing that everything he thought he had done unraveling. Not only are members of his family rebelling against him, he has a dangerous foe in the in the person of Joab, and we're going to touch on that. He has a dangerous foe in the in the in the form of his nephew, Joab. And eighty percent of Israel wants to desert him. Think about how that would make you feel as a man. It, you know, here I am. I'm at the end of my life. Well, you know, it's, I don't want to be macabre. I mean, I'm, I'm still doing well. But I mean, I have fewer years in front of me than I have behind me. And what if my children decided that they hated me and wanted nothing to do with me? What if my grandchildren walked away from me? What if my wife walked away from me? What if the job I had was taken away from me and I look around me and everything that I'd spent my whole life trying to build is being taken away from me? That's where David's at. That is, that's a hard place. That's a very hard place. Well, David returned to his palace in Jerusalem. He took the 10 concubines he had left to take care of the palace and he put them in a house under guard. He provided for them, but had no sexual relations with them. They were kept in confinement till the day of their death, living as widows because they had been defiled by his son. Oh, hmm. Then the king said to Amasa, I remember now he, he'd appoint Amasa to be his chief general over his armies, replacing Joab. David is making a move here to try to, to put Joab in his place. And he replaced him with Amasa, who had been Absalom's uh, chief general. And he did that to make peace, <laughs> to bring the other tribes of Israel to him. And uh, guess what? Evidently it didn't work. But Amasa... He told the king, the king said to Amasa, summon the men of Judah to come to me within three days and be here yourself. But when Amasa went to summon Judah, he took longer than the time allotted to him. Now, this wasn't an impossible task, but this is a pretty tight schedule. The reason for his delay isn't mentioned. It's perhaps having been Absalom's chief general, maybe he really wasn't too enamored of working for David. Perhaps because he had worked for Absalom, he was unable to get the immediate following among the tribe of Judah because he had been their enemy. They stood, they pretty much stood with David. A lot of them stood with David throughout this entire trial with Absalom. And Amasa would not be popular among them. Mm. Or, or he had replaced Joab, right? Joab, and we're going to discuss this again. I keep saying that, but we will. We'll discuss this in a bit. But Joab was very powerful, especially in Judah. Perhaps Amasa, since he replaced Joab, couldn't get the Judahites to follow him because they were still loyal to Joab. Joab was their guy. David told, said to Abishai, another one of his, I think he was his other nephew, now Sheba, son of Bikri, will do us more harm than Absalom did. Take your master's men. Ooh, who's your master's men? Joab. Take Joab's men and pursue him, or we will find, or he will find fortified cities and escape from us. So Amasa is proving unsatisfactory, but David is still unwilling to reinstate Joab. He's shaming Joab here. So he gets Joab's brother to go. But by the end of this episode, however, Joab will have retaken his former position regardless of David's wishes. Joab is a dangerous, dangerous man. So, and then you notice how from the, uh, the narrative, it switches from Abishai being in charge to, so Joab's men and the Carathites and Parathites and all the mighty warriors went out under the command of Abishai. Jo they're Joab's men. 
They marched out from Jerusalem to pursue Sheba, son of Bichri. While they were at the great rock in Gibeon, Amasah came to meet them. Amasah was on his way back. Joab was wearing his military tunic. Joab still went on this mission. Ah! And he strapped it at his waist. He's wearing a military tunic. And strapped at his waist was a belt with a dagger in its sheath. He ste as he stepped forward, it dropped from its sheath. Oops, dropped it. Joab said to Amasah, How are you, my brother? Then Joab took Amasah by the beard with his right hand to kiss him. Amasah was not on his guard against the dagger in Joab's hand, and Joab plunged it into his belly, and then his intestines spilled out on the ground. Without being stabbed again, Amasah died. Then Joab and his brother Abishai pursued Sheba, son of Bikri. All right. He start off being Abishai in charge, right? After he kills Amasa, hmm, killed another one of David's generals. It says, then Joab and his brother pursued Sheba. Joab is back in charge. So Joab apparently was a force of nature. One of Joab's men stood beside Amasa and said, whoever favors, whoever favors Joab and whoever's for David, let him follow Joab. This is the final yank of authority away from Abishai. He was never destined to be where Joab is. Mm. Two things might be gathered from this summons. Joab continues to enjoy his personal loyalty from some of the troops. And possibly Amasa's loyalty to David was not beyond question. It's very possible that Amasa was not truly in David's camp, even though David made him head over his army. David's making some pretty bad decisions here. But he's trying to get rid of Joab. Mm. Amasal lay wallowing in his blood in the middle of the road, and the men saw that all the troops came to a halt there. When he realized that everyone who came up to Amasal stopped, he dragged him from the road into a field and threw a garment over him. And after Amasal had been removed from the road, everyone went on with Joab to pursue Sheba, son of Bikri. Hmm. Now Joab's in charge again? It appears that his brother just stepped aside. Maybe that was the plan all along. Let him be, Abishai be in charge. They leave the city and they're out of David's sight. And then Job just steps up and takes over. Uh, kind of looks like it. Sheba passed through all the tribes of Israel to Abel, Beth, Mecha, and uh, please forgive these names. You know I'm mean these Jewish names. And through the entire region of the Bichrites who gathered together and followed him, all the troops of Joab came and besieged Sheba in Abel Beth Macha. You notice how all the troops with Joab. Joab is clearly in charge. They built a siege ramp up to the city and it stood against the outer fortifications. While they were battering the wall to bring it down, a wise woman called from the city, listen, listen, tell Joab to come here so I can speak to him. He went toward her and he asked, she asked, are you Joab? He said, I am, he answered. She said, listen to what your servant has to say. I'm listening, he said. She continued, long ago they used to say, get your answer at Abel. And that settled it. We are the peaceful and faithful in Israel. You're trying to destroy a city that is a mother in Israel. Why do you want to swallow up the Lord's inheritance? Far be it from me, Joab replied. Far be it from me to swallow up or destroy. That is not the case. A man named Sheba, son of Bichri, from the hill country of Ephraim, has lifted up his hand against the king, against David. Hand over this one man, and I'll withdraw from the city. The woman said to Joab, His head will be thrown to you from the wall. Then the woman went to all the people with her wise advice, and they cut off the head of Sheba, son of Bichri, and threw it to Joab. Oh, not a good day for, for uh, Sheba. So he sounded the trumpet, and his men dispersed from the city each returning to his home. Joab went back to the king in Jerusalem. Well, having regained his former position, Joab apparently without protest from David, Joab retained it until he was executed by Solomon, which isn't that far away. And my commentary's reading said that with this, the so-called court history of David basically the effective reign of David, if you will, reaches its conclusion for all practical purposes. 
David's going to decline and he's going to be almost, he's, he's almost ready to die. He's getting old and Solomon's getting ready to take over, but there's still some story to be told. Joab was over Israel's entire army. Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, was over the Carathites and Pelathites, and Adoniram, Adon, Adonai, Adonai Ram. Sorry. He was in charge of forced labor. Now, the Hebrew word, I've been told, for forced labor here and elsewhere is used to describe the hard labor imposed on subjugated people, kind of like what Egypt did with Israel when Israel was in captivity. It looks like Israel's taking on that habit of using subjugated people for forced labor to build things. Again, taking on the trappings of the culture around them. I, I don't know if that's good or bad. It'd be bad for the subjugated people, I would think. And then it says, it goes on to say, Jehoshaphat, son of Ehud, was a recorder. Shiva was secretary. Zadok and Abiathar were priests, and Ira the Jerites were David's priest. Something interesting here from one of the commentaries I read. Since the roster of officials here does not begin with the, t with the statement that David reigned over all Israel, this may reflect David's weakened position as king in the wakes of the rebellions of Absalom and Sheba, all rivals for power. Now eliminated, Joab is commander of Israel's entire army. In effect, Joab may be running the show at this point. It wouldn't be the first time a strong military leader was wresting control from the political leader. And David was old. All right. He and and Joab is still young enough to be a powerful man. David's old. He's no longer the warrior king. He's at the end of his life. And he is unable to overcome Joab. So it's possible that for a short time, Joab is actually the force behind the throne, actually the one running the show, even though David's sitting on the throne. So that leads us to a question. Why didn't David get rid of Joab? All right, we've seen this from the very beginning. In the beginning, it says that David was afraid of Joab. Well, there's a couple things to be considered. If David wanted to kill Joab, why didn't he do it himself? Why did he leave it to Solomon? And why did he allow Joab to continue to be such a prominent individual in his staff, even after the misconduct that caused David to want him killed in the first place? One reason is possible is this. As a commander of the army, who was obviously politically well-connected, Joab was exceptionally powerful. He might have been dangerous even to David. Well, <laughs> part of this might be why David didn't get rid of Joab, Joab's family. Maybe he loved the boy. He was his nephew. But I'm not sure. There's a possibility that as being uh, warriors together, that there's a bond between warriors that's hard to overcome. That's possible. I've seen that. Uh, they'd had a lifetime together of war and overcoming insurmountable obstacles. That could be. But think about this for a second. Following the events in which David used Joab to kill Uriah the Hittite, there would have been a very strained relationship between David and Joab. David did something incredibly illegal that could have garnered him the death penalty. He murdered Uriah the Hittite and he used Joab to do it. Joab is the one person who could have exposed the treachery of killing Uriah. And from that day forward, Joab could have exposed David's treachery and maybe he held that over David's head the entire time. Maybe that's why David is afraid. And if he, if Joab exposes David, then he exposes Bathsheba and her son Solomon, who would later become king. Oh my goodness. So you could see possibly that Joab 
felt he could probably act with impunity. And he held this thing over David, and I, I could see that. I could see that happening. Um, and later on, you remember when David was crying and mourning over Absalom, and Joab comes in and castigates him, chews him out. And this is what he said. Today you've humiliated all you men who have just saved your life and the lives of your sons and daughters and lives, wives and concubines. You love those who hate you and hate those who love you. You have made it clear today that the commanders and their men mean nothing to you. And, and he's inferring that they mean a lot to me, but apparently they mean nothing to you. I see that you'd be pleased if Absalom were alive and all of us were dead. Now, he makes a threat here. This sounds to me like a threat. Now, go out and encourage your men. I swear by the Lord that if you don't go out, not a man will be left with you by nightfall, and this will be worse for you than all the calamities that have come on you from your youth till now. Mm, that sounds like a threat to me. He's really playing his, I've got something on you, David, and if you do not do that, what I say, I'm going to rain hellfire down on you. That, that's, that's what I'm getting here. Oh, at least some commentators have suggested that this was a very real or at least implied threat. Um, Dr. John MacArthur, a uh, scholar, theologian, he says that Joab, who was the esteemed general of the army, was a dangerous person because of that power. He was also dangerous to David because he had disobeyed his command to spare Absalom and killed him with no remorse. He wasn't afraid of any repercussions from David. He wasn't afraid of any repercussions when he killed uh, Abner. And you can see here he's probably, he had no fear of repercussions for killing Amasa. Oh, this seems to suggest that Joab himself could have been dangerous to David if he didn't comply. The fact that jo Joab pre prefaces his statement with, I swear by the Lord, could also suggest, suggest that he was making a threat rather than just a prediction. If you don't do this, David, this might happen. That's not what he's saying. He said, I swear to the Lord, if you don't do this. <clears throat> Joab was not a beloved nephew of David. He had some serious, serious power. So, I don't know. I don't know if... I don't know if this is uh, the reason for Joab acting the way he does, but it, I, this is one thing that's been in the background, this whole story of David that I've wondered about. And it just brings to, to the top of my thinking that... Being David, ah, oh, had to be hard. <laughs> Think about all the children he's lost, all right? He's lost multiple sons. Uh, his daughter being raped by one of his sons. Um, he's at the end of his life, and all that he had sought to build is vanishing. Israel has left him. All that's left is Judah. And... Everything's precarious, and his, his chief general basically is busting up to him and threatening him with no fear of retribution. David tried to demote him, and Joab would not let him. That tells you how powerful Joab was. At the end of his adult life, and he's at the end of his life, at the end of his adult life, he's seeing everything melt away. Everything that he strived to build, everything he believed that God had told him to do was being taken away. So put yourself in those shoes for a second. David is seeing that his sin with Bathsheba from decades before, the repercussions are following him even now. And whether or not he was in love with Bathsheba at this point, I believe he was probably. Uh, whether or not he was in love with Bathsheba, what their relationship started in sin. And that sin 
has not left his doorstep. So what can we infer from that? Well, sin has repercussions. When you sin against God, it has repercussions. You can be saved, you can be forgiven, you can be redeemed, but that doesn't mean that the things you set in motion won't continue to be in motion. That's what's happening to David. He was a man after God's own heart, yes. He sought God, he worshiped God, he was a warrior king, he was a priest king. He did an amazing thing in Israel. But I don't know if the surrounding culture sucked him in. I know that when he was on the battlefield, he was wonderful. When he was at home as a family man, he was not so much. I don't know if the power and the trappings of the monarchy uh, derailed him. I don't know. But as a man who at one point went through bankruptcy, I know that money derailed me. I fell in love with money. And I pursued a job because I had a bigger paycheck, not because it was something I believed in or thought I could do well. And I paid a price for that, paying a price for it to this day. David's life, yes, full of victories, but in so many ways, full of crushing defeats. And he is, at the end of his life, watching everything he'd done being pulled away from him. And he's losing power and position to Joab. Joab is setting himself up to make a run at David. And I think this last time when David actually tried to demote him, I think that was the straw that broke the camel's back. I think Joab has had enough of, day, of his uncle and he is gonna take him out. That's my thought. Now, I don't know what's coming next. I spent so long since I've read this story. So tomorrow we'll find out what's happening. But being David was hard. And sin has its repercussions. Oh, that's a good place to stop, I guess, or a bad place to stop, depending on your perspective. I'm Paige. Here's my coffee. And you know what? It's still very good. Have a great day. Bye-bye. <laughs>